Uh, they have what? Bacon wrap chicken bites. Chicken bites. I want the chicken. Okay. No, We're live. Welcome to Harvest Breakfast Live 2020. It's the 31st annual Harvest Breakfast, and obviously it's a little different this year. We're going virtual. We're with the University of Maryland Extension Office today, but more importantly, we're with you in your home. So you might be watching on Facebook. You might be watching on TV. However you're watching, we want you to be engaged. So pick up Facebook, comment any questions you have, join the conversation, enjoy the show, and I'm going to kick it over to our hosts, Jenny and Rachel Rhodes. Good morning. I'm Jenny. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. And welcome to Harvest Breakfast Live. Like I said, my name is Jenny Rhodes and I am your county ag agent. I work for the University of Maryland Extension. We have an office right here in Centerville. And I am also a lifelong resident of Queen Anne's County. I'm a grain farmer and poultry farmer. And Rachel, let's hear a little bit about you. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Rhodes. I'm the horticulture educator for the University of Maryland Extension in Queen Anne's County and I am the Master Gardener Coordinator. I am not a lifelong resident of Queen Anne's County. I was a transplant from Caroline County. And That's okay. We'll let you stay here. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to stay for a while. My husband and I own a small poultry farm as well, and we have two sons, a couple of dogs, and a few cats. All right. So many of you out there may not know, what is the University of Maryland Extension, and what do we do? So we are a statewide, non-formal, education system within the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. We have offices in every county in Baltimore City. The University of Maryland Extension programs and problem solving assistance, so we lend assistance, and we're available to assist to citizens and are based, all of our, everything that we do is based on research. So we, so what is it really that we do? We really take cutting edge research from our land grant University, the University of Maryland College Park, and turn it into practical uses to improve lives across the, the state of Maryland. 
My program includes agronomy. Queen Anne's County, our claim to fame is that we are the largest producers of corn and soybeans in the state. So of course, my program does a lot with agronomy. I also do a lot with uh, risk management. Uh, one of our big programs is the Women in Ag uh, program that we do. And then also poultry. We're gonna hear a little bit today about poultry. So I also work with backyard uh, flocks and also uh, commercial flocks around the state. I have, a, I have a feeling people can hear our poultry right now. <laughs> you think they can? They can hear our chickens? <laughs> So as you know, um, today is a little different format and we are really sorry that we cannot be with you uh, live. You know that I like and Rachel, we like to socialize and that's really important part of Harvest Breakfast is bringing people together from the chamber, from government, from you know, all farmers, from all walks of life and you know, to talk about you know, how our businesses are doing because you know, it all goes back to the same really principles. And we don't get to enjoy the beautiful table decorations. Our office always works hard on, um, you know, beautiful decorations. And, of course, that wonderful Eastern Shore breakfast. But don't worry, we're going to talk about Scrapple later on today. One of my favorites. And, and cream chip beef and missing the fried potatoes and biscuits and, you know, other things. All the healthy things. Yes, all the healthy things. So don't worry, we're going to talk about healthy food today, too. So. Um, so, like Bruce said, this is our 31st uh, harvest breakfast, and even COVID is not going to keep us from celebrating the harvest today. So, speaking of the harvest, as you know, when we start out harvest breakfast, I give a recap um, of the year and kind of things that have gone on in, in our ag community. And so, I'll st kind of start with that, and then we'll, we'll move into some more exciting things. We had a, a pretty mild winter, as most of you know. We held our annual, annual agronomy day. That was at the 4-H uh, park. We actually had uh, record attendance this year. After that, right before COVID, we hosted an on-farm uh, poultry field day with over about 400 people uh, attending that. But then COVID-19 struck. But you know, for farmers and many of our essential workers, life really didn't change much uh, for them. Farmers who are able to get their crops uh, in the field, uh, get things uh, planted, and then we went on to uh, wheat harvest. Harvest wheat harvest was um, pretty good, and then into corn harvest. Uh, some of our farmers um, were kind of disappointed, maybe with their uh, corn years. Even though they were good, we had still had a good year, but we thought that we had a lot of rain in August, and really maybe we had. I won't say too much rain, but we just didn't have the sun. So farmers need growing degree days, they call them. So it's the heat units that we need to really to, to um, make our crop yield. But we're not going to complain because we're still very blessed um, in the long run. And then, uh, so now corn harvest is about done. I think most farmers are, are done corn and pretty much wrapping up uh, with soybeans. You'll still see a lot of soybeans in the field. They'll, they'll be working on, on soybeans. And... Uh, farmers are also now planting cover crops, so that's the green that you see coming up um, in the fields now, which has been somewhat of a challenge just because of all the rainfall. So, Rachel, um, tell us a little bit about cover crop. What do you... So, a cover crop is planted, and uh, usually they can start in about September. It's mm -hmm. usually flown on, or it can be planted in the ground, and it's planted to pick up any residual nutrients that may be left in the field after mm -hmm. corn and soybeans and that they're planted so that residual nutrient doesn't run off into our Corsica River right. and then into the Chester and then into the Bay. Right. So farmers use cover crop as a way to help protect our environment. Yeah. Queen Anne's County does plant usually the yeah. most amount of cover crops in the state. Um, we're a big county for that, we are. Um, and our farmers take pride in the work that they're doing to help protect the bay. Yeah, they really do. So I think that's important for people to know that. So that's when you ride by a field and you see that green stuff out there, that, that's cover crop growing. So let's talk, talk a little bit about chicken production. Uh, two weeks into COVID, I'm thinking, oh, man, we're good. You know, um, farming is going to be the same. Um, but then we started hearing about COVID in the processing plants, not only local, but also across the, across the United States. Um, we heard about schools shutting down, restaurants started shutting down, and this really put our whole food supply into a tailspin. I can tell you, I never thought I would see the day that we would have empty shelves in our stores. I always told people, you're gonna realize what a farmer does when you have you know, empty shelves. But I think the one thing that um, 
people don't understand is how our food supply works. So if you really think about it, 50% of our food goes to groceries and then the other 50 grocery stores and the other 50% goes to restaurants, schools, institutions. And you think about how they package those things. When they package uh, those, you know, what goes to the grocery store is very different from what gro goes bulk to restaurants and, and schools. So, you know, these processing plants, they just couldn't flip on a dime. So even though we might have had a lot of frozen chicken in the freezers, but then we had, couldn't find chicken at the store. So that was kind of one of the effects of, of COVID. And then that's why you saw, you know, things kind of just changed overnight. We saw dumping of milk. We saw vegetables, you know, that couldn't get to be processed. So it was just on and on. But we are learning and we are adapting. Um, my mom always says out of bad things come good things and one of those things is people are shopping locally. So we have seen a resurgence of growth in farmers markets, roadside stands, we've seen farmers you know just do a 360, they're selling on the internet, you know you can come and you know, pick up curbside. So lots of um, good things do come out of something bad. So Rachel, let's talk um, a little bit about what Extension is doing to help our community uh, over this COVID period. So I think Extension has really done a good job of adapting how we do our programs, especially through COVID. We've had a ton of questions about gardening, doing a backyard flock with chickens, food, cooking, food preservation, and how to make your money go a little bit further. So today we're going to start, we're going to, we have a lot of different people from the University of Maryland Extension and the community to talk about how we're going, how we manage through COVID. So Rachel, let's see, how are we doing on time there, Bruce? We're good. We're at two minutes till John's supposed to come in. Oh, okay. the fun. Um, okay. So we got two minutes. Okay. So Rachel and I will um, talk a little bit about um, gardening. So what are the calls that you've had? Well, you know, it's been a very interesting year. As, as many of us know, we're in this position where we've been teleworking since March. So people have a ton of questions about what's going on in their garden, things that they wouldn't have normally noticed with their trees or their shrubs, how to manage those, how to do things with their lawn or soil tests, or even simple things about how to grow a tomato. Yeah, some things that we take for granted. Exactly. On a exactly. farm and, you know, always having a, having a garden. And one point you did make is we want people to know that we are here. The University of Maryland Extension, we may be teleworking, but we are here for you. Um, yeah. You know, pick up the phone, send us an email. Uh, we are all still working very hard. Yeah. And Rachel, um, if you don't know, Rachel is my daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, you know, we do have the same last name. Mm -hmm. And we have really had a good time. Um, canning uh this summer yes it's been a great year for canning it has been a good year for canning so i think maybe if COVID, you know maybe it brings us back to some of the um, family basics and i know it's helped kind of slow me down i'm not you know not a lot of road time not exactly of meetings and i think i really enjoyed you know being with my family and i've gotten a lot of you know a lot of calls on food preservation yeah yeah so well you get more with the food preservation mm -hmm. i get more with the actual growing of the food but mm -hmm. it has been a great year especially i know with my kids showing them the process of how to can or you know how to cut up a tomato mm -hmm. and you know all of those little things that normal people maybe we didn't have time to do before yeah, and now we yeah. certainly do so yeah, that's, that's been a true. very very yeah. good year for that right on the agricultural side i'd say um well you know we're working with uh, farmers they've got to have their pesticide license renewed we have a nutrient management license farmers have lots of license so we are working you know we'll be bringing all those via conference call or zoom uh, we'll be doing those across uh, really across the whole state but we'll still have our agronomy day it'll just you know it'll just be a little bit different i've been getting um a lot of calls about uh, backyard farming yes a lot of calls about backyard farming so one of our um john moyle uh will be here with us this morning to talk about backyard flocks yeah i so, think he's about ready is he ready oh, to come yeah. in yeah all right well let's bring him in so while people are waiting and we're waiting for john to walk in please uh know that you can keep asking your questions or comments on facebook and we will be having a giveaway today, so stick around Ooh, for that. Good, good. Well, are we good? We're okay. good. Morning, John. Good morning. morning. Good. So this is uh, Dr. John Wall. John and I uh, work together, so I'm a county ag agent, and 
I have to tell you, I can't be an expert on, any, on everything, but we have specialists at the university. So what I do is I get a call, and if it's something that I can't answer, I call John Moyle because he is our state poultry specialist. So John, I'll let you talk about yourself and what you do and kind well, of what you got in your hand there. All right, so my name is Dr. John Moyle. I'm with the University of Maryland. I got it right this time. <laughs> Sometimes I get that wrong now. Um, with me today, I've got my daughter. We brought a couple birds with us today to show you what they look like. And to start off with this one here. This is a Seabright rooster, and he's a bantam. So if you want to look at the size difference between him and the, her, you see how much difference there is in size? That's because, you know, they're, they're different breeds. This is a small bird. That's a standard size bird. Sorry, he doesn't want to go. If we let him loose, we'll really have some excitement in here. <laughs> Thought about it. But anyway, these are just some examples of what we're seeing. With the, with the COVID, like you were talking earlier, with the Rona going around, we're seeing a lot more people getting small flocks. And so one of the things we're really trying to do is do a lot more outreach for people with the small flocks, how to take care of your backyard birds, what you need to do with them, and how to keep them safe and spot the spread of disease. And one of the questions we're always asked is biosecurity. Right. How do I keep my birds safe? Sorry, he just wants to get loose. He really wants to go. Think so, of the views, though, if he does. Oh, so you know what? Okay. I thought about that. Look at the fun we could all <laughs> have running have, around. Does he have a name? Okay, yes. This Brewster is named Not Sir Brave Sir Paul. <laughs> now, we kind of named him after a friend, but he's also kind of a, a scaredy cat when he was littler, and he would always throw the hens in first and let them get, you know, anyway. He's just really a fraidy cat. Now he's getting meaner. If I were to turn him loose, he'd probably try and attack most of y'all in here. This is one of the hens. Now, this is one of the hens here. If you look at her, I don't know if we need to bring her over here or what. But this one here, she's what they call an Isa Brown or uh, Isa Brown, depending on where you're at. It's a, actually a sex link bird. So when they hatch, the bird, the Wait hens are. Wait a minute, what, what is a sex link? What's a sex link? I was mean? going there. Okay. Sex <laughs> links means when they're hatched, the girls are one color and the boys another. So you can just pick out the boys and the girls really fast. This is actually a commercial type layer. She will lay eggs like there's no tomorrow. In fact, uh, I know for a fact these girls are still laying six, well, there's six of them, they're still laying six eggs a day and they have been since they started laying in June. So they're going to keep going like that for a long time. They're very forgiving. If you're going to start a flock of birds, I would suggest something along this line because they're one of the easiest things in the world to raise. They're forgiving, they lay a lot of eggs, they're very efficient. This guy on the other hand, he's a Seabright, he's going to be a little more trouble. He's not going to lay, well, he's not going to lay any eggs because he's a boy, but <laughs> this breed doesn't lay very many eggs. And they're also susceptible to a lot of diseases which are naturally in our environment. So they're kind of actually in some ways a sentinel bird to let us know what's out there. So they're not one I would suggest. However, they are very pretty with the, with the gold color, with the black lace. They're actually a gorgeous bird. But so he's the, he's the rooster and this is the hen. Again, if you look, you can see the difference in the wattles. The wattles here underneath the chin. See how much bigger his are than hers. That's an example of what's a rooster. He's also got a bigger comb. Granted, he has a rose comb and she has a single comb, a little bit different, but you can see the size difference in comparison. It's one way we can tell the difference between males and females. Now, where was I going? So, <laughs> I talked about biosecurity. Biosecurity, see? <laughs> this is, okay. I've had a long morning, all right? I've already chased this guy through the woods once today, so, <laughs> you know. So, John, what is biosecurity? Biosecurity, that's a great question. If we look at it, what does bio mean? Life. Life. Security is? Protection. 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 So biosecurity is just life protection. And it's really kind of fun right now to teach biosecurity because what are we telling everybody to do for the COVID? Wear a mask. Wear a mask. Wash your social, hands. social distancing. Don't go anywhere. You know, all this. That's the same thing we tell our farmers. So what we want to do on biosecurity is we want to, okay, we have a flock of birds. Keep them away from everybody else. If they don't go around your flock of birds, they're not going to get a disease. We also want to keep people from going out there. So we have three parts to it. We have the first part, isolation. The second part is traffic control. Control who goes around your birds, what comes on and off your farms. And the third part is sanitation. So if I need to borrow something, say I need to borrow Rachel's tractor or something, I'm gonna, she's gonna wash it. I'm gonna bring it to my farm. I'm gonna wash it and disinfect it. Then I'm gonna use it. Then I'm gonna wash it. And then she's gonna come pick it up, take it home, wash and disinfect it. So we wanna make sure that we don't spread disease that way. Mm -hmm. If you look at the spread of disease in animals, the number one problem is humans. So as part of biosecurity, if I go to a farm today, well, I, I have to go home and change now because I've handled a bird. First thing is I'd have to go home, shower, change, wash everything up before I would ever go to another farm because I don't want to take a disease to somebody else. So um, what, if, what if my neighbor has chickens and I have a backyard flock? Do I need to abide by the same rules? It, because it's not a farm, it's just a backyard it's an excellent bunch question. of chickens. Well, you know? we actually have a liability to, pay, to take care of our birds and to actually prevent the spread of disease. That is something that we legally have a liability to do. So if I, let, if I have a backyard flock and your birds are out there and I'm letting my birds run on your property, that's actually a problem. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a responsibility to keep the birds on my own land and to keep them away from others. Most of the time, we don't see a lot of conflict because we do occasionally have some small flocks move in next to a commercial farm and the birds will get loose. But if we talk to the people, it's really been very, very positive. There hasn't been any problems with it. So we just want to make sure that everybody understands the rules. Part of that is everybody needs to register with the Department of Ag. That's right. So the Maryland Department of Agriculture has a small flock register. Well, it's actually commercial farms are registered as well. The reason we have that registry is in case there's a disease, then we can come out and find where those birds are at, know what's going on. Because if I don't know where your birds are, I'll be honest with you, if there is a disease outbreak, we'd all be out knocking on doors trying to find birds. Right. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to stomp disease out, whether it's in small flock, commercial, or whatever. We want to protect everybody involved in this. So, John, suppose I saw you today and I'm like, oh, I want to have a backyard flock. So how do I get started? Well, the easiest way to get started, uh, most of the local feed stores will have chicks. Now, this time of year, pretty much going to not be able to find chicks. The only way you're going to be able to find chicks this time of year would be to order offline. There are a lot of very good stores online that you can order from. One thing we tell everybody to look for is what we call NPIP, which is National Poultry Improvement Program. And I always got to get that right. And what that means is those birds are clean. They don't have any diseases. They're, they're taken care of in a proper way and they've been tested. And we don't want people to get birds otherwise because they could bring in a disease such as mycoplasma or something like that, which can then spread around and cause problems for everybody. So online is very good. Now, if you go to like the local feed store and they have chicks, I, pretty much, I don't know any of them that don't order from NPIP. So those are safe as well. So those are some of the ways we want people to get birds. Typically, you're going to probably see a lot more in the spring. Right now, the only birds you can find online are some, like this type of layer type bird is about all that's available at the moment. I was looking the other day, I had a friend that she wanted to get some. In the springtime, there'll be a lot of options. Uh, with, the, with the disease outbreak in the United States, we actually did see that all the stores sold out. They were, they were all sold out for a long time. You couldn't find birds anywhere. Find we find supplies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even the feed stores were out of feed. So again, if you have birds, remember you have an obligation to do it right. You have an obligation to them. The other thing, if you're going to get birds is remember this, it's 24 seven. If you want to go on a vacation tomorrow, That's right. who's going to take care of your birds? Yep. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to go on vacation. They'll be fine. I'll throw some feed out there. That's not the way it works. Like with all animals, we have an obligation to take care of them and to treat them well. So John, I have a backyard flock. I it's, I'm pretending. I have a backyard flock because I'm not allowed to have chicken, a backyard flock. I, I know what flock you have. <laughs> yes. So I have a backyard flock and my I have my little bitty babies. When do they start laying eggs? Ah, it's a good question. What they're going to do, for example, in this breed here, it's going to take longer than this breed. This is a commercial type layer. Um, I was going to say, I think they start at about 14 and a half, 15 weeks which is actually very early. We typically say about 18 weeks is when you start, 17, 18 weeks. So they started really early, but they were bought in the spring, so they were getting larger. You know, they were growing during the summer as the daylights were lengthening, which will help improve that. So we tell everybody roughly, you know, five to six months out. Mm -hmm. Now, in the wintertime, they're going to stop laying eggs as the days get shorter because the daylight, they're, they're depend on daylight for their signal to lay eggs. One way you can keep eggs throughout the year is to put a timer and a little light in there. 40 watt bulb, well, they're all LED now, but the equivalent of a 40 watt bulb for a little hat, chicken's coop is going to be just fine. Give them 15, 16 hours of light and they'll continue to lay year round. So do you need to winterize your chicken coop? Ah, we just had a talk on this two weeks ago. We did. You can so, talk about what you Oh, that's have. right. We're actually going to talk later today on breeds. So at noon, we've got to talk on that. But we do some, we do have programming that we're doing online. It's called our backyard farming program. And if you look it up, well, Google it, University of Maryland backyard farming. We have a lot of classes on small flocks, and we're going to start over again in the spring with beginning all the way through. But Rachel, to your question, yes, uh, here on the shore for winter, as long as your birds are protected from weather, example, you don't need to insulate. As long as there's no wind on them or no rain and water on them, they're going to be fine. Okay. Now, what about their water dish? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, they always, there are some really good electrical ones out there that you can plug in if you have electric out there. If you don't, one of the things I tell people to do is Get those rubber feed pans, those little short rubber feed pans. You can knock them out. I've had some for 30 years now, I realized. Just put water in those, then when they freeze, go out two or three times a day, dump them out, put fresh water in, and that way they've got water for the majority of the day. Mm -hmm. But again, if you make your own, be very careful that you do it in a way that won't cause a fire or an electrical issue. Yeah. Yeah. John, I'm going to go back um, one. Um, tell us, can everybody have a chicken in their backyard? I mean, how... <sighs> Chickens about, I think everybody should. I think chickens are great. It's an awesome way to teach kids about it life. Is. 
Mm -hmm. Agriculture and the way things work, you know, it's even the tragedies can be turned into a great learning lesson. Um, in the state of Maryland, most counties will allow it, but then again, you have the county level, then you have the city level. So if you live in a city, does your city allow it or not? And then you have to, one of the biggest restrictions has been homeowners associations. Right. So look at your HOA and find out what they say. Mm -hmm. Those are great yeah. tips. Yeah, those are. Those hey John, are. we actually have a question from Facebook. Oh, oh okay. No. Yeah, we have a, uh, Janelle had asked, uh, what suggestions do you have for those who get a backyard flock and receive a majority of roosters? Uh, uh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm a, I come from a different school, I guess. My opinion is you grow them up, you can them up, and you have some chicken noodle soup throughout the winter. <laughs> um, but again, that, that can be a problem. And that's, we can teach you how to do that, right, John? That's right. We, we actually are going to, we're actually talking about this. We're going to start a fact sheet on that. <laughs> oh, it's okay, buddy. Well, there it is. That's the action. Yeah. That's there you go. He's, he's ready to go. See, we <laughs> talked about <laughs> canning. Like, man, he's ready to go. I'm he's out like, of here. Oh. He's like, not me. Yeah, well, but see, that's, that's one thing you can do. When you get your birds, you can order what they call straight run, which is just a mix of males and females. It should be roughly 50 50. But again, odds are sometimes you get more or less. Or you could end up with, uh, you buy pullets. If you buy pullets, those are going to be like 95% females. With the last flock, you got, let's see, we got 11 birds, only one was a rooster. So, I mean, five of those were straight runs, so four out of the five straight run were hens, which is very rare. And the other one, oh, hold on, buddy, hold on. The other one, uh, this, well, actually, he was the only male. So that's the only male we had on that batch. Hmm. So can you tell me how many different breeds of chickens there are? <laughs> no. <laughs> In alphabetical order. Awesome. There's, there's, a, there's actually over 400. We're gonna talk about this at noon today on our backyard farming. There's and you over can find 400. That you can find that on the Extension News and Events page, right? Yes, or you can find it on, we actually have an Extension webpage just for poultry, and it's on there as well. So if you go umd. Extension.umd.edu slash poultry. I know, I always get it wrong. I just tell everybody to Google Maryland Poultry Extension, it'll show up every time. Uh, John, let's talk a little bit about um, eggs. And uh, do you have to have a rooster? To have eggs. We get this all the time. Nope, you don't need a rooster for eggs. Uh, but if you want to hatch eggs, you definitely need a rooster because the eggs will be infertile. But you do not need a rooster to have eggs. The other thing I want to point out, since you bring that up, the other question we get all the time is hormones, steroids, and poultry production. On the commercial side, it's never been done. It's been illegal since before I was born. So that's something that you don't have to worry about. The reason birds grow so big and fast in commercial situations is feed, housing, and genetics. And you can do that same thing in your backyard if you want to. Yeah, good. Well, good. thank you so much, John. Yeah, so I've learned right. so much today. How much time do we have left? One minute? Okay, John, is there anything else that you want to uh, wrap and up with? Something honestly, that we... just enjoy it. I mean, take this time. Yeah. I mean, we're all talking about being home with COVID and all that. But I, I really love the parents that are actually doing all the more. We're seeing more gardens. We're seeing more small flocks and chickens. We're seeing more and more small ruminants. What a great opportunity to get together as a family and to interact with, with nature and the environment and with agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's actually how I started my chicken career. I was in 4-H in a broiler project for years. My sisters and I, we had a great time um, every year raising them and getting, we had actually had a broiler contest and we had a good time doing that. See, I, I grew up with them. I can't remember a time in my life my parents didn't have chickens. We grew up on a poor farm out west and I just, we always had chickens. My good. earliest memory is my brother getting caught in the coyote trap, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for letting us come in. We really enjoy yeah. it and y'all have a great day. Good, Thank John, you. John, one more thing. How yeah. can they reach you? What's your email? Oh man, you would ask that. It's J-M-O-Y-L-E at U-M-D dot E-D-U. Right, or they can contact me or- and Or we'll, Google, we'll, I'm telling you, man. Yeah, just, just any, Google. Any search engine will pull us up right away because we're really easy to find it. And we really do enjoy questions because it's, yeah. it's the way people learn. Good, well, thank, thank you for getting up early this morning. We know you had to, had to drive this morning to come, but we appreciate yeah. it very right. much. Thanks for inviting us, we appreciate okay. it. All right. Thank you, John. And they didn't even make a mess. I know, no. well, they didn't back my truck. <laughs> <laughs> Martha Anthony said, thanks, great job. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye chickens. Take off. We'll put you guys back. All right, so next uh, we're going to take a break, and um, our break is going to be with Mandy and Chris Johnson. And we also have a giveaway to talk about, too. Oh, oh that's right. We yeah, do. Yeah, we do have a giveaway. So we have a giveaway. Uh, Mandy, if you wouldn't mind, we had the trivia question, and we can put that on the screen for people, but could you read the trivia question to our audience at home? It's on the screen right here. It's on the screen. Oh, there we go. The trivia question yeah. is, do you need a rooster to get eggs from your hens? <laughs> now, hopefully you were just paying attention. If they were paying attention, they would know this. If you paying attention, you should know this. The first three people that can answer correctly will receive a gift basket, which is actually right next to you. 
which is a fabulous gift basket. <laughs> and the first three people, will have, uh, once uh, your segment is done, so if you get your answers in before Mandy's segment is done, and you can win the basket. Go ahead, Mandy. So I am here. Welcome. Definitely welcome. This is fun. I am here with Chris. How are you, Miss Chris? I'm wonderful today. Good. So tell us your county official title. Okay. Like Jenny, uh, we are both uh, faculty members from the University of Maryland. And where Jenny does agriculture, my main focus is youth development and animal science, and I do ag safety. Ag safety. So 4-H. 4-H. That's a big, and we have a very large 4-H organization in our county. I don't mean to brag, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> we have yeah. literally the best 4-H park in the whole state. Yeah, it's really if nice. If you've ever been there, and we have the best volunteers. I mean, this year we had the situation with COVID, and we had to close all of 4-H down. And our county 4-H volunteers on their own went on and still held uh, county fair type activities for our youth. But 4-H is actually, uh, people think you have to have a cow, you have to have a chicken. Yeah, right. a lot of our kids do have chickens, a lot of the fancy breeds. But it is a youth development program and we have our 4-H pledge, and I know Mandy, as a former 4-H'er, <laughs> will you say the pledge with me? Sure. I pledge my, my head to clear thinking, my, my heart to greater loyalty, loyalty, my hands to larger service, my, my health, health to better living, living for, my for my club, my community, my country, and my, my world. And in that, the whole purpose of the 4-H program is we are trying to conduct activities which are experiential learning activities that encompass all of those H's, the H's yeah. where the youth, when they come through the 4-H program, they will become young adults that are very capable, are very competent, end up being the leaders in their communities. And as our background slide says, that it is proven through research-based education, which is what we are, that 4-H'ers, as they mature, are four times more likely to be involved in their communities. They're the leaders of the Lions Club, the Rotary, the Rorotans. They are two times more likely to make healthier choices, meaning in their lifestyles as far as drugs, drinking, smoking, food. Um, and they are two times more likely to go on in STEM-related, like, higher education type fields of work. So, and that has been proven, you know, with data that they are. So we're real proud of that. Here in this county, we also have extremely traditional, what we call our 4-H clubs that meet monthly. Um, we have a marksmanship program. Yeah, that's something people probably don't know. Um, it's top rated in the nation. We have, over the years, probably have had 15 kids on full college scholarships related to what they learned at the 4-H park by volunteers. Right. Um, it's a pretty and, big program here. And that's what we are. Mandy is one of our best volunteers. <laughs> she doesn't know how to say no, ever, <laughs> which is a good thing for me. Um, here in the county, paid is myself, and then we have Sally Rosenberry, who is a 4-H program assistant. Our role is to recruit and train and work with volunteers to conduct these activities. For our youth, we average about 400 youth in our traditional club programs. And then we also have um, in-school programs. We do embryology in all the kindergartens. We do programs with Bay Days with third, fourth, and fifth graders, and then all the seventh graders come to the 4-H park for our Ag Awareness program. And then someone that's looking into the program, before we wrap up, how can they get a hold of you to learn more about 4-H or to become interested and get engaged into 4-H? Uh, just like John said, we're pretty easy to find. We're the Queen Anne's County Extension Office. Um, if you know where the Sheriff's Office is, we're the front half right of their there. building. There um, my email is cjohnstn at umd.edu. Um, unfortunately, right now, because of COVID, our youth programs are, are pretty me. well shut yeah. down. And Mandy, you're aware, tell them of one of our volunteers that just went 
above and beyond and what is she doing for our program? Yes, yeah, so we have a volunteer that started an online, um, I guess, group, I guess. Mm -hmm. And because 4-H can't meet, she started and they do shows and they give, they're having giveaways and the kids are participating on, she's actually reached out of our county now and I think she's in like four or five other surrounding counties. Oh, kids it's are, in like 10 states. Yeah, it's thing. all over and it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So check her out, Mandy Snyder, it's, it's super cool. 4-H uh, teaching others on Facebook and it's just been phenomenal because as I said we 4-H was shut down even more so than Jenny's programs because of the youth and they didn't want us working with youth and, and spreading COVID. Uh, we had a short window of a couple weeks where we were starting to open up and now as of last week we're shut down again. So um, we're all about adapting that's right. And what we've done is I'm on several different little small committees, and I know a lot of people are Zoomed out. <laughs> but we have picked certain areas, and we just finished up last night a session with 13 to 16-year-olds on career readiness. And we had kids from six different states, and we met with them on Wednesday evenings and did... Um, like resume writing, career planning, internships, um, how to interview, even things like social media. We had the kids show us their social media pages mm -hmm. and things on there that, no, 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 your potential employers will look at your social yeah. media. Well, thanks for coming to join us, and we're going to turn it back over to Jenny and Rachel. Yeah, we, we, we have finished our, uh, so with that segment ending, we now have to announce the winners because oh. we did have oh, people yeah. that won. Oh, oh we have yeah. winners. So uh, what was the correct answer, guys? No. 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 Yes, perfect. So we did it, and everyone that did answer said no. Oh, awesome. Very good. So uh, our winners were Casey Foreman, Vernetta Sherman, and Martha Anthony. So we'll Yay. be reaching out to them. Yay. Yay. <laughs> we'll be reaching out to them once this is over, and we'll get in contact with them about how we can get you your bag. But uh, for our next guest, go ahead. All right, so up next is Royden Powell. He's our local Queen Anne's County legend, historian, <laughs> farmer, scrapple extraordinaire. Royden was actually my boss when I worked for the Maryland Department of Agriculture, so I got to work with him extensively. And through him, I learned so much about the agriculture industry and the scrapple making process. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Royden. He's going to talk about the history of Scrapple and all the goodness that Scrapple encompasses. Good morning, Rachel. Good Hi. morning, Royden. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for coming. I'm so excited that you're here. I and I love your shirt. Thank yeah. you. I thought it was appropriate. I thought it worked. Yeah. You know, at our quote-unquote normal harvest breakfast, Royden always jokes that he's the Scrapple apprentice. <laughs> you know, like you have to have special training about when to know when to flip that Scrapple to that get the perfect true. crisp on both sides. It's, it's, it's an annual event that I look forward to, and it's an extension of uh, what I like to do with respect to, to cooking and preparing, helping Paul and his various catering activities and harvest breakfast has always been an event on the schedule, so we look forward to that each year. Yeah, it's a great So, Roy, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Um, I'm a native of Queen Anne's County. I grew up uh, just outside of Centerville, uh, graduated from Queen Anne's County High School, uh, went on to far farm for um, a little over 20 years in a family grain operation. Uh, that evolved into a, a involvement with soil conservation, being a supervisor on the soil conservation district and ultimately going to work for the Maryland Department of Agriculture, where I worked for uh, about 22 years working uh, in soil conservation water quality programs at MDA. So I had the opportunity to work with farmers across the state and people that are committed to caring for the land and producing quanti quantity of safe and, and productive food. Right, and you did a great job. Thank yeah. you. That's for sure. Thank you. I can't believe you're there 22 years. Wow. I know. It went quick. It, it did go quick. quick. There were busy days. And sure. yeah, you, we went through some pretty tough times we there too, need. and some yeah. pretty controversial times. So, so let's talk about Scrapple. <laughs> Scrapple's great. Scrapple, in fact, is getting a, a whole um, new respect, if you it will. Is. It, it's, it's, it's elevated uh, as one of the pr premier breakfast meats now, and uh, we'll talk about some of the the venues and the mechanisms by which Scrapple's promoted now, but. Uh, it's, it grew out of, um, I think, a, a frugal and, and probably an efficient culture. And primarily, it's geographically specific to the Mid-Atlantic area. Uh, as you travel uh, much above Pennsylvania, lower New York, 
um, you can't find it. Uh, if you go south, even into Appalachia, you, you run out of mm -hmm. it. So it's, it's very specific to Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, uh, lower New Jersey. And as I read, it's, it grew out of sort of the, the German uh, Dutch cultures. Mm -hmm. And those were cultures that were both efficient and frugal and wanted to make use of everything. Nothing went to waste, did it? That's all. what they always say. You, you use everything in the hog but the squeal. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so. And those are very prominent cultures in yeah. Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware. Yeah, and I think we're yeah. getting back that today. You know, yeah. nothing go to waste. I mean, yeah. I think with exactly. times of COVID, I think people are really looking at their food and say, you know, I'm not going to buy too much. I want to make sure I use it, or do I freeze it and can it, or what that, we do with it? It's it's been it's been amazing. I've been it's, it's it's interesting to watch people in the grocery store as food supplies get scarce, and how they become aware of where their food comes from. And mm -hmm. in fact, many people are going in this COVID episodes now are, are locally sourcing food. Mm -hmm. So particularly, you know, in meats and locally right. processed commodities, uh, they're seeking out those venues and those marketplaces right. locally. So yeah. can you tell us how Scrapple is made? Do you really want to know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The people demand it. <laughs> <laughs> the people have asked. Uh, Scrapple's made entirely of, of, of ports, parts of the hog. Mm -hmm. uh, it's primarily um, made from meat from the head. Mm -hmm. It also includes uh, the way we make it, uh, the heart. Um, portion of liver, um, and then cornmeal, flour, and some spices, yeah. primarily salt and pepper, sage, and sugar. And Roy, behind you, um, Lee um, Bridgman put together, this is a, a copy of our family um, scrapple recipe that mm. I, I asked my mom to, to share. So it has all of those things in it. I think people don't realize, you know, the, the, the cornmeal, you know, the flour, the right. spice, the sage, you know, and, all those type of things. And every family has their own special recipe and take on how to make it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the unfortunate myths is that everything that's left over goes in the scrapple, and that's not exactly no. true. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's a very finite recipe. And as you say, each family has their own tradition about how they, how they go about that process. Mm -hmm. So right. it's, um, it's, it's an evolution locally. Uh, again, growing out of an agrarian society where people you know, produced right. their food and in many cases mm -hmm. were processing right. those animals on the farm for their yeah. for the yeah. consumption. Yeah, so do you have any special things that your family does with Scrapple? Any type of events? Well, there's a, an event that, as I say, um, because many families would do it locally on farms, there were families that would help one another. Right. One, If you were going to butcher this weekend I would come to your farm and help you and then you would come and help me when it was time to butcher my animals so the event that we have today is is an outgrowth of that um, my father and Mr. Jim Pippen uh, Mr. Bunky Callahan and Mr. Bobby Thompson were all very involved in uh, processing pork or curing hams and things of that nature so today um, we're now the a generation or two removed from that so um, their family and I get together and we um, carry on that tradition and the one of the great things that I think is um, great about the activities not only the, the things that come out of it in terms of what you can eat but you're actually preserving or maintaining an art right. exactly and, it, and in, there's a culture mm -hmm. that if we don't maintain it if we don't continue to do it it gets lost mm -hmm. yep. and I think that would be unfortunate because again it's a reminder of where we've come from and where you know how our food's yeah grown That's, and processed yeah. so it's yeah. Um, yeah. some of the equipment that we use is some of the original equipment with the grinders and the stuffers right. and for sausage mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. so it's um I think one of the neatest thing about um making scrapple and um, I can remember as a child growing up and we would go to my um, grandparents and do it and a couple years ago we did it at my brother's shop but the art of making scrapple and um, you get everything in this great big pot and you stir with this talk about the paddle and how you know when scrapple is done okay well the process begins with as I say preparing the meats so you have the meat from the head and commercial processors will often cut the meat from from the head um, traditionally those heads are boiled so they're boiled and, and the meat's rendered from that. Um, and then separately you have the hearts and the livers, the tongues are removed from the head. They're cooked separately. All those ingredients are ground, right. twice in fact, and put back in this large pot where the heads were cooked. So the, the meat from the heads and all those other ingredients are ground, put back in the pot with some liquor 
from that cooking process with the heads. And then they're seasoned. So then you have a seasoning process, which for us is generally, it's a, it's a season to taste. So yeah. I couldn't write the recipe down if you asked me to yeah. because it's, a little yeah. bit of this, a little bit of that. it's, it's, yeah. it's something like that. But with those very, with those, just those four ingredients, you know, you've got a range. So, it, yeah. and um, as you say, each family kind of does it the way they like it. And we've kind of seasoned it to the, the level of seasoning that we like. And many mm -hmm. people like a sage flavor in, in right. what they eat. And that's important for us. So after the seasons are added, then there's a thickening process when that's where the, the cornmeal, the white cornmeal and the flour are added and they're added in equal portions. And it's a continual process. You stir that because there, there's a fire under this pot and you don't want the material to stick. And what, is, and what do you stir it with? It was a wooden paddle. It almost looks like a canoe paddle it's, almost, it's doesn't very, it? It's, it's, it's yeah. like a very narrow right. canoe paddle. That's, mm -hmm. a good, that's a good description. Um, and you continue to, to stir that and thicken it and, and, and ultimately when the pot for us when we say when the paddle will stand up in the pot that's when it's time to take it off right so it's scooped out of the large <laughs> pot and put mm -hmm. in just in a loaf pan or a small steamer pan mm -hmm. for example and then it sets up overnight and then it's ready to slice and enjoy I love good, scrapple good. Yeah, we've had a lot of people on Facebook not a lot of questions but a lot of people commenting that they love scrapple and they love the way you yeah. described it we did have one person comment, they don't need to know what's in it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> comment. Fair comment. Uh, yeah. But I know, I know I, a question I would have, okay. and, uh, probably a lot of people, too, that watch, is more information about the Scrapple Trail. Oh, yeah, oh, the Scrapple okay. Trail on Facebook yeah. is a really great Facebook group. I think it has about 6,400 members, and they actually have a map of where you can buy Scrapple in the Delmarva and Pennsylvania area. It it's right behind you. Us. Yeah, <laughs> which is, which is an, it's a, it's a Google map that somebody has put together and you can just click on it and find out, you know, where that place is and how fat, how low, how far Scrapple is from your area. I think Scrapple is yeah. probably an acquired taste. I hear people that move here and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't like it. It's just like, I yeah. think you gotta, you gotta, you have to try it. Yeah. I, I read an article recently that if you describe it as I did with the, with how it's made and, and what goes into it, it's less appealing. But if you call it a breakfast pate, oh, oh hey, there you go. Off. Okay, yeah. a breakfast pate. It's all about delivery. It's all yes. about how you frame it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know for me, there's nothing better than a scrapple egg and cheese sandwich in the morning. Well, like, wait a minute. So how do you like your scrapple? Do you like it thin? Do you like it crispy? Oh, I like it a little bit thick and crispy and mushy in the middle. Roy, how do you like so, so, so you want all three things? Yes, I do. Okay. I want it all. I want all. I, three. I'm with Rachel. I, there are people that'll burn it to a crisp. In, in yeah. my opinion, I like it crisp on the outside, but but soft in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My absolute favorite recipe is a fried egg, uh, two pieces of scrapple, pepper jack cheese on okay. cinnamon bread. Oh, on cinnamon bread. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to, to try toasted that. Cin toasted cinnamon. Bread. I have to try that because sometimes I like it with a little bit of maple syrup. So uh -huh. you know, I like ketchup on mine. Yeah. Actually, oh, I don't. I don't do ketchup. There, there are people. A lot of people enjoy mustard. So that's the yeah. interesting part yeah. about the scrapple trail and what that's brought out is you get a lot of people a expressing interest and say, hey, this is something I really like. Yeah. But you get all the various interests and, and variations on how people like to enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, Good. thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure. It was fun. Yeah. And, you know, in lieu of our traditional harvest breakfast and not seeing you cook, uh, this is the second best for me. Yeah, that's so. right. <laughs> Very true. That was fun. Thanks for coming in. Thank Alrighty. you so thank you. much, Royden. Right, Have a bye great bye. day. Right. So okay. we, just, we just heard about a lot of food. And yeah, I'm hungry. hungry. Okay, so we're getting we hungry. We need to eat Scrapple. We do. <laughs> we do. Wait a minute. Why aren't we cooking Scrapple right now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so up next, we have our wonderful family and consumer science representative. And she, her name is Cheryl Bush, and she is going to talk about healthy food options. She was a little upset because we were talking about Scrapple, I have to tell you, because her job is really about nutrition. So I'm like, but we have to talk about Scrapple. Yeah. It's harvest breakfast. It's what everybody looks forward to. But she's going to uh, bring us some tips and uh, things that will make things a little easier for us as, as we talk about food. Yeah. So it uh, goes across the board. Us, a uh, um, uh, family and consumer science educator and agent here, we talk about nutrition, health, wellness, food safety, food preservation. 
And in um, covering that today, I'd like to just flip that switch a little and talk about how to build a healthy breakfast and um, kind of talk about the food groups and just get some different ideas for uh, saving you some money as well as some kitchen hacks. So um, what I wanted to do was start with another protein based off of my plate, and that would be the wonderful egg. All right, you're a chicken farmers, you produce a lot of eggs, and eggs are pretty much a gold standard for protein. So I'm gonna show you um, and demonstrate a little about a microwaved souffléed egg in a mug. It's so easy. All you think of is two egg and two tablespoons of milk, and I'm choosing a lower fat milk, and also then two tablespoons of some type of cheese, whether cheddar or you know Parmesan. But I chose uh, goat milk cheese today because I was thinking about Rachel, who really likes goat milk. I love goat hey, cheese. Cheryl, what happens if we don't have milk? So you know, in these days, of maybe we might not find all things in the grocery store. So. Great. Talk a little bit about what you would do if... Well, um, you can use dry milk powder and then reconstitute that. And if you don't have that, there are shelf-stable milks that you can use that are, you know, held through high temperature processed and will last quite a long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you can take evaporated milk and add water to that. And, you know, right. just so that you're not using a condensed sweetened milk because that's right. another whole piece there. So, so I've used a little bit of uh, cleaner for my hands and I'm going to just crack an egg into that. That's my grandson's favorite thing to do is crack it's eggs. Crack the yeah, eggs. Oh, they love does. cracking eggs. And I've been learning lately that you're supposed to actually crack onto a surface rather than this so that you can eliminate those shells going in. Ah, okay. Good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to give this um, a little bit of a spray here because this does have a very sticky action. So I'm going to spray this mug a little bit inside, a little butter spray. And I'm also um, pointing out that you can use a butter spray, you could use an olive oil spray, whatever that you prefer. Okay, so I said the two eggs there, and then we're just gonna add two tablespoons of milk. And I'm just being careful, not pouring so that I don't make so much spill in the studio here. Okay. And I would like to add um, the cheese. Okay, I'm just gonna take two tablespoons and this is like a kind of a similar consistency to Parmesan cheese, but this is called Pecorino, a uh, goat cheese. Oh, Rachel will love that. She I loves goat cheese. Yeah, it's higher in sodium, so I don't really need to add, you know, my extra salt. But what this recipe does call for is if you wanna use a Himalayan salt or coarse kosher salt, and you just kind of add that to it. I will add just a tiny bit of pepper Give that some flavor. And then I also chose to have some um, basil. Now, you can do all kinds of variations with this if you wanted to put in some fresh herbs, um, you know, chives and basil, um, spinach, anything you wanted to really toss in there is great. So, so why are you putting that glove well, on there? Well, I handled um, a protein source. I handled the meat. And because I cracked those eggs, I just wanted to make sure that doing a pinch of this, I'm not introducing any kind of uh, bacteria. That's right. So oh, that's very, very food important. safety point. Very important food safety tip. Right. So. Yeah. So could I add some like leftover grilled vegetables from oh. the night before? Yeah. If you like, I think if you made them very thin and yeah. small in this one, since they would yeah. already be cooked. Right. You know. So I'm just kind of stir that up, and we cut that into our microwave. So how long in the microwave? Well, for this part, it's only going to be a 30 second. 30 start. seconds, okay. All right. All right, let's see. 30 seconds, and okay. We're going to, you know, kind of get the consistency first to show everybody on okay. camera. So okay. It's really quick on that one. So. Okay. So that was the moment of truth, too. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure that microwave works. That's right. <laughs> and the studio doesn't shut down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can be a factor, right? And with us working, teleworking at home, I know just having, you know, a lot of cords, a lot of new things that, is that you're true. working with in your home, it's different. So you have to kind of watch that and be safe at home. Yeah. Well, I feel like we've all been eating from home and maybe we're not choosing the most healthy options for and our then, snacks. So this is a really good this protein is, snack. And that, that is so true, Rachel, because we are about 40% more of Americans are working and cooking at home. So, mm -hmm. But see, this consistency is kind of thickened, and, you know, it's just it's got to um, go the rest of the way. So you just do that to make sure, you know, okay. that you're not going to have this um, run over 
and go too high. So, so how much longer do we have to cook so that for? What I'm going to do is set it for 70 seconds. Oh, 70. Oh, wow. It's okay. a big work one. With that. Yeah, That's a big a one. Longer, so. Okay. But in the meantime, I wanted to make sure to point out that with um, Family Consumer Sciences, all of our programs, we focus on food safety. And the internal temperature of this egg should be 160 degrees. And we do that by actually kind of cleaning up a um, thermometer, a food thermometer here. And I know Bruce recently worked with me with this, making a one pan spaghetti, and he was using this thermometer. Bruce just so you got to get all of his germs off there, <laughs> is what you're saying? I get right. Sure. <laughs> all right, and you can you show us it. the thermometer trick? Right. Oh. When, when you're in the um, industry, you take the handle that is given, the cover that's given, and actually slide that through. That way, when you're putting into soups, stews, you have a little bit of space and you're not getting any kind of steam burn. So. Oh, okay. That is That's so exciting because, you know, I have one of those and I never knew that. I just put it in there. And <laughs> exactly. I, I've seen her show that to about eight people now and all eight didn't know that that's know. what it was for. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had no idea. There's so. a lot of little tricks too. There is a nut bolt that's underneath and you want to always calibrate your thermometers, you know, every six months or so. Put that in a, a ice water, a cup of ice water. If it's 32 degrees, that's reading and registering correctly. Hmm. Okay, tip of the day, got that. Yeah, right. All about food safety. So let's see what it looks like. Voila, and this is the interesting part. This has a fluffy texture to it. I can hear how fluffy it is from across the room. <laughs> yeah. You can hear fluffy? That's yeah. pretty good. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and it's, it's done and it just, it's got to taste great. So if someone would like to try that, well, you made that for Rachel. Yeah. She has to try it. I do. She has her cheese. I do. Here, I'll take it over. Okay, that's it. great. Thank you. <laughs> Am I allowed to eat okay. on air? <laughs> <laughs> so moving on with our mind plate, I wanted oh, to gosh. show um, okay. next that's about so the importance of uh, having your grains, okay, and also vegetables and dairy fruits. As we talked about, you could actually add some vegetables, some little asparagus tips. I know Bruce really likes um, and put that into those eggs. But That's true. Um, next, I wanted to uh, show you that it's really important to try to save your money. Um, I happen to have a guest right now at home, and he eats a banana once a day. Bananas are currently about 59 cents a pound, so that can add up. So as you can see here, um, most of the time when you're trying to ripen bananas quickly, you put it into a brown paper bag. However, we have a banana hack now at our house that I've been using, and this is through the Chop Chop Family Production newsletters that will give you that source so that you can um, obtain those from our website when we're uh, done today. But if you want to keep your bananas um, looking a little bit when you get them green uh, and keep that ripening slowly so that I love you, green bananas. Yeah, so you like I green, like and I like them more this way. I don't like, like them with the brown spots. So. To keep those brown spots, you just simply take a plastic wrap, and you can do this singly as it shows on your camera with the single bananas, or you just wrap that whole group. And if you keep that wrap on there, and each day taking a banana away, this actually traps the ethylene gas that's in the banana, and it stops it from ripening. It kind of fools or tricks the banana. Can That's save a you great tip. A that is a great tip. Yeah, it has really helped uh, our budget at home. So I like that, but that trick a lot. And next, I wanted to talk about dairy. Dairy is very important, and not as many people are actually eating breakfast, but people are eating more yogurt and more cheese, and so that is helping our dairy farmers. Um, it's important to know, you know, what dairy and milk really is. When you're talking about cups of milk. Whether white milk, chocolate milk, it provides about 325 milligrams of calcium. And you can't get that unless you eat about five cups of broccoli. So milk is really a great source and milk is needed for all ages. So um, we have up there that kids that are ages two to three need two cups a day. And then four to eight year olds, two and a half cups. And when you get to nine and over, we really should have three servings of dairy a day. Um, so with that, we talked about, huh? You know, oh, Rachel, you like you know, Greek yogurt? Yeah, I like Greek yogurt. Yeah, so the Greek yogurts are very good because they have a little bit higher protein content and they also have calcium. Um, the one thing you want to watch for with all yogurts is that sugar content. So carbohydrates in a regular yogurt, about 26, 27 grams of carbohydrates. And a serving of carbohydrates is really just 15 grams. That's something that 
with a program that we have coming up, Dining with Diabetes in January, we point out you know, how many grams of carbohydrates you should have a day, how many per meal, how many numbers. So with that, you wanna make sure that you can get as low as possible on the carbohydrates because you really wanna be carb conscious when you're making your breakfast. Yeah. So the Greeks have about oh, six to eight to 10 grams. I always look at the sugar content for right. those as well because right. they can hide a lot of sugar if you're not sure. Especially you because know. they're the added fruit, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. So you really wanna watch that, that it's a little mm -hmm. bit lower sugar. So um, with that, I, I also wanted to uh, talk about um, grains. That, that's a wonderful thing to try to get in fiber and don't forget your fiber. You do that through things like breads and cereals. But don't forget that fiber also comes through fruit. And so I have this lovely um, uh, display of the fruits today and fruit serving sizes, about a cup, or as I have here, another way to just eyeball it, about the size of baseball would be a fresh fruit. And that way you will forget your fiber. So we need about um, 38 grams of dietary fiber a day for men that are 50 years and younger. And for women, uh, 25 grams of dietary fiber a day. And kids, you can help make the kids have, um, whole grains by adding wheat breads, rye breads, brown rice. So don't forget the fiber for your healthy breakfast. Great. Well, thank Good. you so much, Cheryl. Yeah, cool. This great. egg is delicious. Too. That's great. It and you're right, it good. didn't need any extra salt because of that cheese. That strong it's flavor perfect. Cheese. So well, yeah. thank you for having me. And you can reach me also yeah. via our um, extension website. And my um, email is cherb at umd. Edu. Oh. Please look on our website. We'll have the season the newsletters that have these um, you know, recipes. And I really look forward to uh, continuing to help you through telework and different vis um, virtual programs that we'll be doing. Thank Good. you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, me. Cheryl. That's thank sure you. good. We all, we all love food. We yes. do. And we're always looking for different, you know, different ideas. And I know a lot of us are searching on Pinterest. and But certainly go to any education uh, website, edu website, or search, you know, if you're looking for canning or, or those kind of things, because we know that they're research-based, and Absolutely. I think that that is, is very important. So I'll turn it over to Rachel as we go to our next break with Mandy. All right, so we do have another Twitter question for Mandy. So hopefully they were paying attention again. Yes, okay. I hope that they were paying attention. And remember, the first three people that get the answer correct will win the gift bag that's next to Mandy. So Mandy, what's our next question? The next trivia is, what can you do to your bananas to make them last longer. So until the end of this segment, you have time to answer right below, comment on Facebook, and the first three people will win the gift bag. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So Mandy is with Master Gardener Larry Lorenz, and he's here to talk about the community garden. Yes, so I get the fun segment because I'm live with Larry. They don't get that. <laughs> so, welcome. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. So, Rachel was telling us you're the master gardener for the Galley Community Center. Is that correct? Right, the Galley Community Garden. Garden. So, where is that located? That's located in Chester, just off of Cox Neck Road, and just south of uh, Route 50 in, on Kent Island. Okay, and tell us a little bit about the garden. Some people that don't know about master gardening, tell us a little bit about it. Master Gardening uh, has a part of it called Grow It, Eat It. And the idea is, is that you grow your own food and you share it and you eat it yourselves. And as part of that program, we have uh, established a community garden in cooperation with the Galilee Lutheran Church. And this garden was started about five years ago with a group of four or five master gardeners on Kent Island who partnered with uh, the church who had land available. It was raw land, and uh, they invited the garden, community garden to come in and use their land. Nice, now, you say community garden. Um, say I were to live down on Chester, or Ken Island area, and I wanted to participate. How does that work? Is it a fee to sign up, or how, how can this be um, helpful to the community? It's, it's helpful in that it provides people who don't have land uh, where they live to be able to garden. And uh, this is on Kent Island, we have 55 plus communities. In addition, we have communities such as Gibson's Grant. 
and they don't have any gardening allowed around their properties. And so this allows somebody who wants a garden to come and have a garden, and we provide raised garden beds for them. Now, if I was interested um, in inquiring about a raised garden bed, how do I go about doing that? How do I contact well, someone? Well, you contact us through the uh, Facebook, uh -huh. and it's facebook.com slash Galilee Community Garden. Okay. And uh, you would contact us, and we would uh, give you a history of the garden and show you what we have, give you a tour of the garden. And there is a small fee that we ask, but it is a donation. Okay. So if you're financially uh, not be unable to pay, we either reduce the fee or we eliminate it. And we have some gardeners who live in public housing nearby, and we have gardeners who live in large houses on the waterfront but like to come and have a raised bed so they don't have to have it on their own property. And how long has this been going on? How long have you had this community garden? It started in uh, five years ago, uh -huh. and uh, this is our, our fifth year, and we've grown from four demonstration beds five wow. years ago, uh, which were, we started with herbs, pollinators, uh, perennials and annual flowers, as well as a, a demonstration bed for grow it, eat it for the vegetables. And each year we have added additional beds. And these are beds that individual members of the public can use for the summer. And we provide the raised bed, we provide education. Uh, last year we had really gotten into our education program. This year we've been stifled by the COVID, COVID yeah. but we've had more interest in gardening this year yeah, than definitely. ever before. I know I'm a big gardener. I love gardening. <laughs> I can have the worst day at work and go in my garden and just sit out there till it's pitch black with a flashlight picking beans because there's no worries in the world, but right. you in the garden. <laughs> yep. and this has been a great fall for beans. Yes. I've had a pretty good harvest of them. Um, my lava beans came on later this year, yes. but I still had a pretty good harvest. Wonderful year for peas. Um, I've grown peas twice. I did spring peas and I, early peas and then late peas. And um, I had four pickings in both. So it was really, that right. was really good. You had a great spring for peas because it stayed cool longer yes. into the, in, than usual. And then with the gardens, um, I noticed here you have other community involvement and partners. Other people partner up with you? Yes, we do. Um, in addition to the church, uh -huh. which is a, a wonderful partner, uh, we have the local Boy Scout troop. Uh, Boy Scout Troop uh, 495. And over the past uh, five years, they have had four eagle projects oh, wow. in the garden. They started out with building our first 10 beds. Uh -huh. And then following that, they built a bridge across a swale between the church parking lot oh, nice. and our garden. And then we had uh, a, a scout who was interested in doing a mobility accessible bed. Oh, that's a good idea. And this is for people who are on walkers or once we, this year, we put in an ADA compliant access to that bed. Uh -huh. And so we now have an ADA compliant uh, bed for people nice. to use. And we have a woman who's started with the garden two years ago using a walker. And uh, this year she was able to use the uh, garden and, and she's better gardener than any of us at age 93. Wow. Uh, she started with her grandfather gardening a few years what ago. What a story. <laughs> well, thanks for coming to join us. And before we wrap it up, tell them again how they can get a hold of someone for the Master Gardeners to participate if they'd like to inquire about the gardening. Well, they could certainly ca contact Queen Anne County Master Gardeners. Uh -huh. But in addition, you can go directly onto facebook.com, Galilee Community Garden, and we'll respond to any uh, thing that's left there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. We've enjoyed our live with Larry, and we're going to turn it back over to Jenny. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Larry. That well, that was great. I know we have all enjoyed our garden uh, this summer, and I think a lot of people are really getting into gardening. And you know, things. You know, like you said, we grew up doing. A lot of people have never planted a garden, so this is a great. And you can see the pictures um, that they put up uh, of the garden, and they are just they're gorgeous. So people have really done a good job with that. So thank you for coming. So in our next segment, we're going to continue with uh, gardening. Well, so we, have, we have to announce our winners, too, for the oh, trivia Oh, I forgot question. that. Oh, keep me straight. Oh, first. you're good. So what was the answer? Do you remember the question? What was our question? How do you keep the bananas fresh oh, longer? Oh, yeah, wrap the, wrap the saran wrap around it. That's right. Wrap the stems in saran wrap. And we only have one person to get this one right. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah, so uh, congratulations to Donna Smith, who will ah, be contact yay, after, the, uh, Donna. after the show, and we'll make sure she gets her basket. Okay. Or her, her goodie bag. I mean. All right, so I will turn it over to Rachel. All right, everybody. So Bruce and I are actually going to have a face-off and do a Rachel Hollis Bruce a holiday container arrangement. Which is very unfair for you. <laughs> You're going to lose. I'm just going to say. So I, you brought me a cat apron. I appreciate that. No problem. No problem. I thought it suited you. It did. It's very festive. It is very festive. So we all know that Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday is next week. And um, I had a request from Bruce to do a carving of the Mayflower on a gourd today. It seems simple. Yeah, it's totally easy. But I figured it would be kind of hard to find actual gourds that aren't rotten right now like how would you feel if i literally pulled a gourd out though <laughs> like you would have been really surprised i don't have a knife <laughs> there you go it's a county building that's a weapon there you go here yeah. all right so what are I'm we doing thinking now? about your safety yeah that's right so we are going to do a holiday patio arrangement so it's the perfect time to go ahead and trim all your evergreens your boxwoods your hollies any cedar or pine and with those trimmings, you can make a holiday arrangement that can go in your containers that are empty from flowers. Mm -hmm. And you can spruce up the outside of your house with just things around your yard. I dig it. Yeah, saving money. It's COVID. It's time to save money, That's right? That's right. So we're going to have a face off. We right. get, what, 10 minutes to That's right. do this. You get the big one because I know you want to win. I um, don't want to win, Rachel. That's that's very going false. <laughs> he will win. He will win. Whoever that. wins gets the trophy. That has my name on it already. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can scratch that out. Yes, you, that, well, that's how I scratched it in. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so no rules. We just get no all the stuff to, to, to use. We have lots of things that I found in our yard and neighbor's yards that let me pillage. So. You and you'll tell them how you're doing yes, it the wrong I, way. I will tell okay. them how I do it the right way and how you're doing it in the wrong way. And you asked if I knew how to use these. I did. I, I didn't want this. you to harm yourself. I did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you stay on your side. I need them. I need them. Oh, well, you, well, too bad. You can stick with that stuff over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when you're doing, can I have a stick? Oh, my gosh. I Take the stick. I don't want that no, one. You I got want that. the white one. Too bad. <laughs> you asked me to get you a stick. You got the stick. All right, so mine is not going to look as good now because that's not the vision I had. However, so when you want to... And a special tip I know, if you cut it at a 45-degree angle, it'll go in easier. I Very good. To... Ah. <laughs> we are so proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. We're something today, everyone. All right, so you do want... I like to have something as a focal point in the middle. See, he's already doing it wrong. <laughs> and you can do that with different varying heights of greenery. So I have some cedar. Here, you want the white? So Rachel, Not now. Rachel, yeah. what good family time could you spend out in the woods looking for, Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. My son and I had a great uh, little adventure picking up different types of greenery and cutting it. Get away from my pine cones. Would um, you answer the question? I just did. You weren't listening. Now, she actually bought stick uh, pine cones. But I did. Did you see that? They're on a stick. She's they making are. making things easier. Yeah, this was an easy option for me because... But she could have come to my farm and just picked them up for I, free. I could have. I could have, but I didn't. Okay. Um, we picked up gumballs, and then I forgot to hot glue them. So, you know, it's all about balance, right? right. So, right. you can just put your stuff in at varying heights. And you can add some pretty little twinkle lights in there. Come on, Bruce. You're getting behind. Mine has some color. Bows. You know, someone's doing all green okay. over here. Like okay. A... Well, you put the color, you put the green in, and then you add the color. If you want to lose. <laughs> if you want to lose. It's about balance, Bruce. I've never learned that in life. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So it's a really fun and easy project that you could do. And you can do it outside. You could have, you know, a family member come over and... Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that you're socially distanced and just, you know, have a little fun doing a container arrangement. So Cut. what do you really need? You need a container. You need a container. Um, you can use, I have, this pot already has bulbs planted in it for next year. So I'm not putting any type of oasis in there. I'm just sticking the branches in. Okay. But if you have a container that doesn't have bulbs or you're not using it for anything, you can actually put oasis in and leave it wet and then you can water it okay. until we get freezing temperatures. 
Now, I'm I not know, sure about yours. Yeah, well, keep dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris is over here. I should yeah. acknowledge that we have Chris in front of us who uh, has been holding a mic over our heads the whole time. Exactly. Thank well, you, Chris, for working job. so hard. And you want to make sure you get all sides. Don't just uh, leave one side bare. Make sure that Watch you're... Watch your tablecloth there. Yeah, I know. It's a little heavy. Make sure that you're rotating it. And you, if you don't want to use a container, you can be creative. Take an old tomato cage and with your floral wire and tie it around. You can make some really cute crafts with that. Um, you can make a Christmas tree. You can make yourself a garden gnome. Oh, is that the big thing now, garden gnomes? I nice. know. I made one last year. It was yeah. really easy to do. We talked about gnomes last year for Christmas. Oh, we did? We okay. did? You don't remember? We went to the gnome house. Oh, that's so, it was so cute. <laughs> Love that little gnome house. You don't remember the stuff we do anymore, right? I know. It's, it's oh. been a year, but Rachel, it's been a year. Rachel, what is it you have in your hand right now? All okay. right, so I have some magnolia. This is gleaned from your yard. It is. Yeah, so um, it's a great little evergreen. You can cut some shoots off for this. You make great wreaths with them. Yes, you can with the leaves. Um, and when you're, if you're gonna do a, um, an arrangement or a wreath with these, I usually do bundles. So I'll take like five or six leaves and put them together with some floral wire and put them on my wreath that way and do it at a time. And I like to do that with my um, wreaths anyway when I'm doing it with evergreen. Oh, oh. gross! <laughs> I'm not. Um, if you're not go. making a mess, you're not having fun. I'm picking them exactly. up. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. Um, and so a lot of stores right now will have those little boxwood trees or boxwood wreaths. And if you're going to buy any of those, you really, and you have boxwoods at home, you really want to inspect those branches for any type of blackened lesions that might be boxwood blight. That's a very um, bad disease that is killing a majority of our boxwoods right now. What are you doing? I'm going for a max color. Okay. What, what about the bottom? Oh, don't worry about that. Okay. You're not worried about the bottom. No, 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 that's where pine cones go. I can't see. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. He has a plan. What, why, why did you take all my holly? What, the question is, why are you taking the holly I grabbed? <laughs> <laughs> Yours might just be a one-sided. Mine? Yeah, in yeah. your face. See? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Jenny was telling me that mine was better in case she didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I find that hard to believe. I have the family, family favoritism in my corner. <sighs> so what else has been going on with you at, and Master Gardening, Rachel? Well, like 4-H, um, our volunteers were kind of halted with any type of activities until mid-August and that's when we could resume working in demonstration gardens. Um, so we started doing that. We have a, like Larry said, we have the community garden at Galilee where our master gardeners volunteer and we also have um, the demonstration garden at the Centerville Library, the rain garden. And Austin just did a really great piece on the um, Austin is one of the QAC TV interns. He just did a really great piece on the library rain garden. He did, yes. Yeah, um, and you can find that on your YouTube as well. So we've been maintaining that. I've been taking a lot of calls about vegetable gardens, landscape questions, that kind of thing. Well, I think I'm done. Oh, what you're do done? You oh, doing? wow. Okay. Rachel is done. Done, is, done is ten sounds minutes, like a... I believe, is 10 minutes out? It probably yeah, is. Okay. It probably yeah. is. Yeah. Oh. I just made a mess in your air. Wait a minute, I found some pine. You were hoarding it. Well, before, well, well give me one more minute because okay. I do want to let you talk about your podcast real fast. Oh, okay. yeah. Our podcast is a great little gardening podcast. It's called the Garden Time, T-H-Y-M-E podcast. Um, we have a Facebook page, um, and you can find it on anywhere that you download your podcast from. It's on Apple, Stitcher, Buzzsprout. Um, we actually have... About, uh, I think it was about 9,000 hits the last time I checked, which was about September. We've had people listening from mm -hmm. all over the country and um, Europe. So it's a really great podcast. If you want some helpful hits about gardening, check it out. Yeah, and I've heard you guys do it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we do have a great fun. It's in, um, I have three, two other coworkers that do it with me. Um, Michaela Boley with the Talbot County Extension and Emily Zobel with... Um, Dorchester County. Awesome. All right. Finish in touch. I'm going to put my last piece in. We have know. people that are watching on Facebook. Let us know what you think. Who won? Don't lie. Say it's me. 
first. Yeah, I went for, I went for colorful. But, but I'm impressed, Bruce. You did a pretty good there. job. Well, yeah. I was going for a seasonal. It's yes, thank you. I was going for. You're not going to see a lot of green right now, obviously in your trees. But I still wanted to add color to what you might see falling around, like the pine cones. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh. I want to add stuff on the. Okay, bottom. first off, I want you to mind your beeswax. <laughs> All right, so we're going to let it everyone in the some room. Stuff on the bottom. Everyone in the room is going to get a vote. Okay. And then we're going to go over to Facebook in case right. they have a vote. Let us know. Put Jenny or Bruce on who you think won. Okay. And by Jenny, I mean Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I Rachel. know who you are. I know who you exactly. are. Exactly. I know who you are. Okay. Just now, I better close this, yes. right? Yes, please safe. do. Don't cut your fingers on Facebook. I've life. been doing so good. All right. So right around the room. All right. Okay. Jenny, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. I might have to go with Bruce's. I don't know. Do you want your Christmas present? It's too present? late. Oh, is this my Christmas present? No, no, Wait no, a minute. No, I'm no, changing. No. I will end this live stream right now. <laughs> no, if that's my Christmas present, I'm voting for Rachel. It's too late. She already said Bruce. I heard one. Mandy? Um, I definitely like Bruce's color. I'm going with the color. Oh. Thank you, man. Uh, it's Linda, festive. Friday's in the room. We have it better yet, but Linda, what do you think? I, I like both of them, but if if uh, Jenny's going to vote for Rachel, or not vote for Rachel, I'll vote for Rachel. Maybe she'll give me that as a Christmas gift. I get a sympathy vote. We haven't met Linda yet in the live show, so it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. She yes, she counts. She's my only vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cheryl. Oh, I'm looking at them both from this angle, and I really like the fullness of Rachel's, but that collar, it just pops. Yeah. Bruce. Oh, Thank I'm you so much. Great job. All right. I, I, my office is next to Rachel's. I hope this doesn't haunt me, but I like Bruce's. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to remove the ones out of the, the since you're making mistakes. Well, I'm taking this home, so I'm Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It. Keep going. All right. So we have two people on Facebook. We had one that they loved uh, my color. The white sticks are so cool. I, you so I'm so glad. White sticks. I'm so glad I used the white sticks. <laughs> And then uh, Paul Rickard says Rachel's looks very natural. So oh, I like thank that. you, Paul. Paul's our boss. So he Paul has is to your say boss, that. so he had to say it. Well, it sounds okay. like I won. It did. Here's your trophy. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you already put my name on it. I did. I did. I'd like to thank University of Maryland Extension for making this possible. They taught me everything I need to know before we started. Yes, we we've been working together for how long, and you finally. You know, did something right. Exactly. And that's, what, ex and that's what extension does. We teach yeah. people. That's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. why I won, because people want to know you could teach. Yeah. Well, yes. thank you, Rachel. This thank was a lot you. of fun. I'll let you go back to your table because oh, we you. have some more people to talk to today. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, we're going to get ready to uh, wrap up. So we have Linda uh, Friday with us. She is the president of Queens County Chamber of Commerce. So Linda, we can talk from here. If that works uh, for you. So as, as most of you know, uh, the Queens County Extension Office and the Chamber, we're partners uh, in this every year. And, and you know our job is to teach our community about agriculture. And then Linda helps to get the people from the Chamber. So Linda, give us an update of what's going on with the Chamber. So um, we've been extremely busy uh, getting information out to our business community. Um, if you're not familiar with an e-blast, if you're a member of the Chamber, you know it very well on what an e-blast is. We've we've done more than we probably have ever done only to get that message out to our community. We are doing business different than we normally, but I think we all are as we're watching today, missing out on the scrapple and the uh, the um, all, all the good food that, that your your department makes is just um, just really sad that we can't taste it, but we're we're happy to uh, We can almost taste it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, but yeah, so we've been busy. Uh, we've got some great partners. Uh, we've been in close contact with our partners, uh, making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, I would uh, encourage if you're a business out there that's struggling or needs additional information that you uh, reach out to either the chamber or to the economic development uh, department. Uh, there is some dollars that are out there. Um, actually, the governor just issued another $445,000 to the county for restaurants oh, good. so i would encourage our business community to see what's available out there to them good excellent yeah good well thank you for anything else you want to share with um, us Linda? i would just uh, encourage people to follow our facebook and our website our website we do have uh we, we did a virtual job fair mm -hmm. on our website this year um due to COVID. so uh, i would encourage you if you're looking for a job to go on our website Look, okay. look to see what's available. We do up that, update that uh, that information on on a daily basis. Yeah. So that changes constantly. Our website changes. Our Facebook. 
So we try to get the, the information out there. Um, staff is working very hard and our partners are working extremely hard. We were fortunate this year, the county, uh, the commissioners gave economic development $2.5 million to go into the business community. And I have to say that uh, Heather Tonelli did a fabulous job in getting those dollars out to the business community. So thank you to our commissioners and thank you to economic development for all that they've done to, uh, to support our, our local businesses. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. We're very lucky. Our county commissioners are wonderful, and you know they reach out to us. You know mm -hmm. if they have questions about agriculture, and but they're very supportive of all the programs. Here, absolutely, here, absolutely. Here, so we are open for business. So you know if you like, I said if you have any questions or need anything, no matter what it is, no matter how small you think it is, my email is Linda at qacchamber.com, and Tracy, who's my counterpart, her her email is Tracy. And that's T R A C Y at QACchamber.com. And our phone number is 410 643 8530. And I would encourage you, you know, no matter what, even if you're not a member of the chamber in your business, please reach out to us. Don't sit and try to figure it out. We are, we're there to help you. We are your support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great, especially in these times of, of COVID and trying to figure things out. And people are kind of doing a 360 on a lot of their businesses. Mm -hmm. And I mean, look what restaurants have done. They have oh, just done a fabulous job. Of, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I would, I would tell our community to support our local businesses. Yes, yes. Uh, we need you more than ever. Um, yeah. So we really want you to support. Even if yeah. we um, have, even if you want to go to our restaurant and you aren't comfortable, go to uh, do a carry out. Right. So there yeah. are opportunities that are available to, to the mm -hmm. community. So yeah. take advantage of it. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot more community. I mean, just riding through Centerville, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they've kind of widened the, the, the sidewalk and we've got chairs out there and you see people at night sitting out, you know, in front of yep. the different businesses. And I think it's it's a, it's a kind of a warm feeling, I think, when you ride by and you see people um, it is. out. And so. I want to thank the, uh, the Extension uh, Office for all that they've done. Um, you have, your department has done fabulous for our community. You did the chicken, uh, at the, at the college we did a chicken sale we yeah, yeah and oh my gosh uh we were in line too we got we, we did get some chicken and i took advantage and i know that the meat locker up in Sudlersville has done a fabulous job our farmers have done a great job so thank you for all that you've done you. to support our fa our community because yeah. um it, it it does take a village to yeah. support each other and i yeah. really we, we really do appreciate well that. we appreciate what you do too it's, it's you. all about people working together absolutely. i think that's you know that's the most important when, when you love what you do we uh, all love our jobs and absolutely it makes it pretty easy so yeah. linda thanks for thank you being here today and thank you for the invite you're welcome uh we're gonna rachel and i are gonna wrap up we're just mm -hmm. about done as you know, uh, the food bank is usually an important part of Harvest Breakfast. And unfortunately, you know, when you came into the uh, Harvest Breakfast, we would ask for donations to go to the food bank. We've done canned donations. We've done monetary uh, donations, but we couldn't do that today. But we still want people to, you know, think about donating uh, really to the food bank. It is uh, very important. And really the food bank, you know, was doing all this really before uh, COVID. So, but now, you know, things have really been, been stepped up. So here's some information you can see on the screen. Uh, Amy Cauley is usually uh, at our food bank. She's our Eastern Shore rep, and she does uh, such a great job. It's amazing. Yeah, we love Amy. We do. She has gleaned, so we know what gleaning is. They're kind of rescuing fruits and vegetables uh, out of fields, and then they're um, taking that to the food bank and distributing. So this year... From eight farms on the Eastern Shore, they have gleaned over 137 pounds of uh, produce. So just amazing. And those produces include what, Rachel? Apples, cucumbers, sweet corn, peaches, watermelon, potatoes, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, fall squash, collards, pumpkins. Amy does a fabulous job she with her does. volunteers. If you would like to volunteer to help glean next spring, summer um, yeah. you can contact amy at her email address it's a callie c-a-w-l-e-y at mdfoodbank.org um, and she organizes gleaners um, from throughout the eastern shore there's many farmers in queen Anne's county that participate in this um, project and you just go out one evening and you pick some produce for those that need it i mean it's about roughly 1.5 million Marylanders have experienced food insecurity in part because 
those workers who were employed didn't earn enough income to support their families. Um, and with COVID, that number has increased as well. Um, so I think it, and this isn't a problem that happens right now. It just it's all the around, time. it's all the time. So right. if you can, you know, help volunteer in that way, if you can't do a monetary donation, right. then Something. that's just as good. Yeah. And remember really the, the food bank can do uh, much more with a dollar than we can. Exactly. Um, I think that's, that's really important. So we just want, in wrapping up, we want everybody to know that COVID has really st not stopped us from delivering our educational program. They're just in a little bit different format. A lot of Zoom, conference calls. You can reach us on our cell phones, um, on our website. Just kind of want to talk a little bit about things we have coming up. I mean, once a month we offer, uh, it's called Timely um, Ag Issues or Grain Marketing. That's always the first Tuesday uh, of every month. We're going to be doing virtual agronomy days. They're going to be across the state. Also, vegetable grower meetings. We have a lunch uh, break uh, with uh, poultry growers on the uh, first and third Wednesday of every um, month uh, at noon. We also host uh, women in ag webinars, and they're on the second and fourth Wednesday uh, of every month. You can tune in live, or they're all archived. So everything that we do is archived and put uh, onto our website. Uh, we're also working on, you heard Dr. John Wall talk about backyard farming. He was leaving here to go uh, do one of those sessions today. So we have lots of things uh, going on, and please stay tuned. Rachel, you have any updates of things you have coming up? Well, usually for the Master Gardener program and the horticulture program, we have a lot of in-person classes, just like you had. Um, and now we're moving to all things virtual. So all of our classes will be online next year. They'll be on our extension website under news and events we'll have virtual master gardener basic training in late spring so we're in the midst of planning that right now good so as we wrap up we want to say a big thank you uh, to lee snappinger bridgman lee is our program assistant mm -hmm. she keeps rachel and i straight actually yes. and she uh i think this was actually her idea wasn't it it was her idea yeah. Yeah, so she's done all the logos and worked really hard. So we want to say thank you uh, to her. And certainly a big thank you to QAC TV. We couldn't yes. do what we do without you. We worked for you with you. I, I don't know how long. We've a long time. But we certainly do um, thank you for letting us come to your studio and, and broadcast live this morning. Yeah, and we're glad you guys came in. This was fun. Yes, it was. I, I know that a lot of people worked on this that you don't get to see. So I want to make sure that George, Ted, and Austin That's get right. a shout yes, out from the thank booth. You. And we had Chris, who's running around the room like a madman all day, <laughs> exactly. helping guide the guests in and do sound. <laughs> yeah. But thank you guys. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yes, good. Thank so, you for having so us. So we want to wish um, everyone a very happy holiday and please stay safe and healthy. Cool. We're done. Awesome. Yay. Great Yay. job. Good job.